Thank you. Thank you very much. John can show you how to do this. focus into our calling together and being Unitarian and thinking, thinking Unitarian ways in this next hour. And to start that work, this is a this one this topic is entitled First Nations and Pipelines, or is it Pipelines and First Nations, I think. Yes? First Nations and Pipelines. And the opening words Is a responsive reading. If if you all have your you all have your and this is where I'm giving these out. Okay, I'm making sure everyone's got a copy of those. It's really the inner sheet is the order of service and it stands alone, but I put them together because they kind of I wanted to make sure they went went all together. So your order of service is in the, is the inner sheet. And, on your order of service, there is a, we start, we start with a responsive reading, which is kind of a call and echo. And what I'm asking everyone here to do is be ready to read the highlighted, the yellow highlighted sentences, of which there are two. So we, we start this off with the opening <coughs> words by Chief Seattle. And I say, actually, careful. Carl Perrin says, and he's the voice that we're really um, recognizing today, and I'll go into more of that later. Chief Seattle said, this we know, the earth doesn't belong to us. We, we belong, belong to the, the earth. earth. This, this we know. know. All things are connected like, like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever if befalls the earth, the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. We do not need a web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Light, a light again once once more. Microphone. I'd like to have Marsha read. Microphone. I'd like to have Marsha read from Wendell Berry, and she will tell you a little bit more about who Wendell Berry is and get after she's probably after she's given her first her reading. Um. Uh, uh. On February 10, 1968, Barry delivered a statement against the war in Vietnam during the Kentucky Conference on the War and the Draft at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. And I quote, we seek to preserve peace by fighting war or to advance freedom by subsidizing dictatorships or to win the hearts and minds of the people by poisoning their crops and burning their villages and confining them to concentration camps. We seek to uphold the truth of our cause with lies or to answer conscientious dissent with threats and slurs and intimidations. I have come to the realization that I can no longer imagine a war that I would believe in to be either useful or necessary. I would be against any war. Property. Yeah. Property. What is it? Theft? Freedom? Home? 
we are meeting on unceded territory of the Sinaiaks and the Tanaka First Nation. Unceded, what does that mean? Never conquered, never sold, never given away. What does that mean? Are we guests? Perhaps we are guests of guests. Our two and four-legged relations our finned and winged cousins, the lords and ladies of the deep, the kokanee salmon who inhabit this home. We owe a debt of gratitude to all our relations. Acknowledge the pains of Mother Earth and rejoice in and rejoice in the rebirth that's happening, whatever that may be. That must be good. Remind me of your name again. Daniel. 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 
My name is Phyllis, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm here to speak about a joy, and that's my friend Dee, visiting me from Victoria, and she's here with me for 10 days. Dee Heston has, is from the First Victorian Unitarian Church of Victoria, and uh, he's visiting us here. Yeah, but before that, um, Dee lived in uh, Nelson for many years, and she was an active, very active member of the Unitarian Church in Nelson at that time. A Unitarian Fellowship. A Unitarian Fellowship. Oh, I'd like to hear about that. Yes. <laughs> I thought somebody might like to hear about it. Would you like to? Writing a candle for the and my delight in the resurgence of Unitarianism in this in this area. Um, we had a West Kootenai Unitarian Fellowship existed in Nelson um, during the 1980s and it folded in the mid 1990s um, because of lack of support. There weren't enough of us. Um, we managed to get up to 19, but at that time we were under the auspices of the um, Unitarian Universalist Association, which was based in Boston. It was before the foundation of the Canadian Uni Unitarian Council. And um, in order to get support from the UUA, you had to be 20, 20. <laughs> we, we only managed to get up to 19, so we were kind of a bit out on a limb, and it was a, bit, it was a struggle, it was really a struggle. So I'm so delighted, and thank you all very much for the welcome, so delighted to see so many people being attracted to Unitarianism, it's great. Remind us of your name. D. 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 I'm Marcia Brondi, and I have uh, two uh, both celebrations and concerns. Um, Friday was World Peace Day, and um, the Castlegar uh, uh, City Council uh, fostered uh, a, a, a a gathering that has happened many times uh, over the last few years with the uh, uh, Duke of War organization and with uh, the Mir Center for Peace. And they all gathered at the underneath the Rotary, um, uh, wonderful Rotary building that they built at Millennium Park. And, and the refugee committees of Nelson uh, the Kootenays and Kesselgar uh, and the refugees of New Denver were also mentioned, but those other organizations were there. And it was an evening filled with um, a, a rich experience of personal and organizational commitments to peace in the world. And it was um, beautiful music interspersed. and. I, I was just very honored to be able to have been there. It was really great. And it was really nice to be able to share it with my friends from the coast. So I'm thankful for that. But I'm also concerned because refugees who come here often only stay a short time because they are in so much need of 
having somebody they can talk to about their real lives <laughs> that they've had to give up completely and they've been shattered. Um, and, and they often go to other communities. Uh, Edmonton has a large Somali population, uh, uh, you know, and so I would like to see um, a, a growth in our bringing in of refugees so that they have some compatriots. And um, the last bit I wanted to share was in thanks for the beautiful uh, uh, show that opened last night for our dear friend Catherine Stewart at the Kootenai Gallery in Castle Gar. If you have any chance at all to get there in the next six weeks, it is a beautiful, beautiful show. <laughs> oh, <laughs> today is World Rivers Day. Has just come back. Mike, to your mouth. Name and Jim. Jim. Right here? Jim. Has just, my daughter's boyfriend has just come back from firefighting at night. He's been gone for three months. Wow. And he's back, thank goodness, thank wow. God. And safe. Safe and sound. My daughter is so delighted. <laughs> and who are you? Right? Who are you? Well, well, you what's your name? Your name? <laughs> Claire, sorry. <laughs> Just checking. I'm pretty sure that you still knew. Light the candle. Light the candle. It's a first for me. That one may not. I'm light, I, my name is Joy, and I'm lighting a candle for my for a former friend of mine, Catherine, who has who has passed on, and I I wish her a, a, a safe transition, and uh, that's it. This for my friend Stefan, who is uh, in transitioning as we speak, and uh, he is uh, is a wonderful friend. And as his parting words was, it was as saw him last, and he says, "I'll see you on the other side." Uh -huh. So that's that's uh, glorious. And uh, one small miracle that happened this morning, right here in our uh, Unitarian gathering, was. <laughs> We got the microphone working. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Okay. And who are you? Oh, I'm John. Sorry. Still John. That's good. Still John. Still. Still John. Uh -huh. <laughs> My name's Keith. I'll do this all in the right order. Uh, first of all, I I want to say a concern. I was just distressed to hear on the news. The terrible rhetoric coming out of the President of the United States about <laughs> just, just casually saying we'll incinerate millions of people. And it's just beyond the pale that they talk that way. It's just... Anyway, this is a... I'm lighting a candle as a, for a time for change. My daughter's at university in Victoria, and, and Jacqueline is um, in Seychelles uh, attending to her very own mother. So it's, um, it's a time of big change. So my name's Craig, and I was really moved by the um, by one of the songs that we sang today. And you mentioned change. You want to hold the microphone closer? Sure. Not the candle. Your <laughs> <laughs> mustache. So so it says, uh, yeah. Don't be afraid of some change. Don't be afraid of some change. Today will be a joyful day. So that was a choice that we made. 
enter, we made that choice. Rejoice, we made that choice. And come in, that was the only question I had. What is the, is it come into this dwelling or is it come, come into, into a place of a mental state? All of the above. All, I of, think the above. all of the above. <coughs> yeah, so that was, uh, that was great. Don't be afraid of some change. Awesome. Easy to say, hard to do. Mm. Practice with that. A few plus the unspoken mm -hmm. thoughts and joys. And we would like and we would like to light this candle for all of the unspoken or not read yet ready to see the light of day joys and concerns that may be in the room and elsewhere. Thanks, Marcia. We're going to enter into about three minutes of meditation. I go traditional Unitarian vehicle for focusing. <clears throat> and it's about three minutes, and I'll just read another little thing from Wendell Berry just to help set the mood. Oh, bent by fear and sorrow, now bend down. Leave the word and argument, be dark and still, and come into the joy of healing shade. Rest from your work, be still and dark until you grow as unopposing, unafraid as the young trees, without the light, with, without thought or belief, until the shadow Sabbath, Sabbath light has made, shudders, breaks open, shines in every leaf. issues that really matter to him and it's so obvious they should matter to all of us. He, he's, he's really um, an inspiration to me. I've actually, I think he's going to come up here on maybe spring day, spring equinox. That's what he's suggested as a good time and he'll inspire us with something. He has a quiet way of presenting. He's a lay chaplain for the UCV and I think you'll like this. will return to the pulpit. Every week is very different from the previous, so come back, please. I have another quote from that essay by farmer and poet Wendell Berry. <laughs> we have lived by the assumption that what was good for us 
would be good for the world. And this has been based on an even flimsier assumption that we could know with any certainty what was good even for us. We have fulfilled the danger of this by making our personal pride and greed the standard of our behavior toward the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. For I do not doubt that it is only on the condition of humility and reverence before the world that our species will be able to remain in it. In 1973, after a pleasant three weeks in our provincial prison, I was riding my bike down Burrard. It was summer, 1973, and I had been caught on the border with three joints of marijuana. I pled guilty and went to jail. Once in Ocala, the provincial jail in Burnaby, I thought, well, if inside prison is this good, then outside must be really, really good. And it is. This is paradise. We are all enlightened. We just don't know it all the time. But so said our interim minister, Reverend Andy Backus, back in 2002. We not only respect the interdependent web of all existence, we are a part of it. We are interdependent. We are not only seekers of the way, we are the way. Or to make it a verb, we are way in. We are doing the Tao. We are paving the path with our footsteps. So I was riding my bike down Burrard in 1973, and I saw this store called Images for a Canadian Heritage. I looked in the window and saw this beautiful print. I was brand new in town and didn't know anything about Bill Reed or Haida Art, but I knew what I liked. So on the spot, I bought this print called Raven and Fetus by Robert Davidson for $16. <laughs> Welcome to Lotus Land. Now there are two stories here. One is the death of my hometown, Detroit, now a vast ghost city. I was a refugee from Detroit. The other story is the rebirth of coastal First Nations, led by artists such as Robert Davidson and Susan Point, and political leaders such as Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. I'll continue this second story, the spiritual rebirth of coastal First Nations. Flash forward to the year 2004. By 2004, I knew that Robert Davidson was right up there with Bill Reed as a great coastal artist. So I went to an evening with Robert Davidson at the UBC Museum of Anthropology called The Abstract Edge. Davidson declared that he is not just a Haida artist selling trinkets to the tourists. He is an artist with a capital A an international force of nature ready for New York, London, Tokyo, and Paris. On that night, Davidson had a new collection which used the Haida alphabet of shapes, myths, and heraldry, but deconstructed and reimagined with a 21st century global sensibility. Some pieces of this new collection featured an old shape with a new meaning, known in English as the trineg or trinegative, because it was traditionally used as a three-pointed form to fill a negative space in background, to add fluidity to the form lines, and to simply frame the foreground. Robert Davidson's innovation was to take the three-pointed trineg shape and through color and position, turn it into foreground into positive space instead of negative space. At that point, I had a revelation. We colonizers, we settlers, based on our cultural history, had seen the so-called wilderness 
the heathen, dark, pagan forest as negative space. Empty, devoid of Christian civilization, devoid of Europe. The only reality which made any sense to our collective wisdom. And the denizens of this emptiness were simply negative people, virtual zombies. Robert Davidson, by putting his trineg space filler into a positive space, showed me that what is foreground and what is background is simply a case of cultural perception. European Christians saw First Nations as empty negative space, lacking our blessings and the salvation of our Bible. We settlers saw them as unsettled. But, as First Nations broadcaster Candy Palmetter taught me, we are not settlers. Because when we arrived, this place was already settled. We didn't settle anything. <laughs> Likewise, whenever I see old Haida representations of white men, they look ridiculous. <laughs> not intentionally ridiculous, but the hats and beards are odd, as if they were copied but not understood. We were lacking Haida culture. We were negative space to them. We were the devoid and lacking savages. Lacking? No, ravenous for sea otter pelts. If for some weird reason. I mean, imagine Captain Vancouver and his crew sailing into so-called Burrard Inlet on June 12, 1792. If you were Musqueam, what would you think of this shaggy collection of Halloween freaks? <laughs> Weird? Ridiculous? Uncivilized? Un-everything and therefore the negative background to your very clear and proper, very civilized foreground as a proud speaker of your beautiful Musqueam language. Hey, what's that thing on his head? A dead bird? <laughs> and once they learned it was a wig, the questions just multiply. A wig? Why? A white, powdered wig? Why? <laughs> you see, the physical photons emanating from George Vancouver on the deck of his ship are the same whether you are his first mate or a Musqueam warrior looking up to the ship's deck. The light reflecting off his costume is still the same when it reaches the eye of the random eagle circling overhead. But the meaning, my friends, the meaning of that visual information is completely different when processed by the brains of first mate, Musqueam warrior, or eagle. What do they see? Captain or devil? Friend or foe? Disgusting or maybe delicious? It's all up to which brain is interpreting what it sees. Because believe me, friends, vision is 60% what we expect to see and 40% what is out there. I repeat, vision is 60% what we expect to see and 40% what is out there. And that's why we have optical illusions. Our biased brains just insist that our eyes must be wrong until proven otherwise. Usually we just categorize what doesn't make sense as simply wrong, and what does make sense as obviously right. And what's wrong or right is determined by our culture, our language, our fashion, popular history and mythology, our religion, and sometimes by what we call, what is called our slow thinking, evidence and logic. Together they make our Weltanschauung or worldview. And worldviews don't appreciate tinkering or correction. For example, creationist versus evolutionary worldviews. <clears throat> our brains are more stupid than we thought. But they're the only brains we've got. We are genetically determined to easily recognize thousands of human faces, but maybe ten kinds of tree bark. That's why we have science, 
because our brains are species specific and culturally biased. Our perceptions are oriented to our own species as foreground and all other species as background. Without science, we would all be stuck in a Trumpian tribalism. <laughs> now, what does any of this have to do with stopping the Kinder Morgan pipeline? Well, it all depends on how you look at it. Does another oil sands pipeline mean development and jobs? Or does tar sands exploitation mean corporate colonization? Plundering our common ground, killing our mother earth bit by bit by bit. It all depends on how you look at it, your Weltanschauung or worldview. A Musqueam elder known, as, known in English as Larry Grant attended a 2007 celebration of the 250th birthday of Captain George Vancouver. He said that many in his nation opposed his attending. But he said, we at Musqueam are generous to a fault. Indeed, I won't review the litany of smallpox, addiction, residential school cultural genocide, murdered and missing women and girls, which has maimed First Nations. I just want to point out the cumulative corporate colonialism represented by the industrialization of Burrard Inlet, the Fraser River, and the Salish Sea. Where is the free, prior, and informed consent to pollute this unceded native land? Where is the respect for the Tsleil-Waututh clam beds and the Musqueam fisheries? Where is the invitation for First Nations to dredge Burrard Inlet for huge Dilbit tankers? Who craves to turn so-called British Columbia into Detroit. Colonization, extracting the last drop of wealth from the soil, is for the hubris of that Enron alumnus, Richard Kinder, and his billionaire buddies, no one else. I saw it in Detroit. Exploit it, suck it dry, trash it, and move on. And now, here we are on the edge of the Pacific. As the 150th anniversary of Confederation approaches, what did Slavitooth Chief Dan George say 50 years ago at the 1967 Canadian centenary? He said, I lament for Confederation. When I fought to protect my land and my home, I was called a savage when I neither understood nor welcomed his way of life. I was called lazy. When I tried to rule my people, I was stripped of my authority. And what did John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister, say about Indians? When the school is on the reserve, the child lives with the parents who are savages. And though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men, 1879. My goal in terms of stopping the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion project is to speak truth to power. Our Unitarian fourth principle encourages our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And our seventh principle is to respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. My goal is to fulfill my vow to our son, Benjamin Perrin, and to his generation, 
that I will do everything, everything in my power to prevent his premature death from global warming. Still, I know that in spite of doing everything in my power to prevent the collapse of civilization, our son's fate will be evident by 2030. And in 2030, I will stop fighting climate change, and I will say to my son, in all humility, I did my best. I really tried to do my best. Right now, this year, in this place, I have an opportunity to prevent a major increase in greenhouse gases by stopping the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Expansion Project. Professor Mark Jacquard of SFU determined the total greenhouse gases of a completed Kinder Morgan expansion, allowing for a maximum of 95% throughput and a realistic storage and shipping scenario Jacquard is estimated that the diluted bitumen would create the greenhouse gases of 20 million cars on the road every day. Burnaby Mountain, where I live, is the choke point for stopping 20 million cars worth of greenhouse gases. We will do our part to stop the insane expansion of the Canadian tar sands. If our atmosphere is going to plateau at 450 parts per million CO2, the two degree maximum, and then come down, we need to drastically cut emissions right now. There's no room for expansion of the tar sands. Expansion of infrastructure for the tar sands is beyond stupid. It's suicidal. That's not what our culture tells us, that's what science tells us. Five years ago, in the New York Times, climate scientist James Hansen said, if Canada proceeds to exploit the tar sands and we do nothing, it will be game over for the climate. Game over for the climate. So where is this paradise I was talking about? How can I stand here and tell you that I have hope? Well, when we look at our history as Unitarians, we've been here before. The last time an ethical truth overcame an economic success was slavery. We Unitarians were conflicted on slavery, as we are now conflicted on First Nations and pipelines. The reluctant abolitionist Reverend Theodore Parker broke the law in order to shelter fugitive slaves in his home and church. We were conflicted in Selma, Alabama, when Unitarians Reverend James Reeb and Viola Liuzzo knowingly took the risk of being killed in order to actively support the emerging civil rights movement. What will it take to stop this crazy Kinder Morgan expansion? Listen to this Coast Protectors Pledge, first proclaimed by Grand Chief Stuart Phillip at last November's Stop Kinder Morgan March in Vancouver. With our voice, in the courts or in the streets, on the water or the land, whatever it takes, we will stop the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Expansion. Over 21,000 of us have signed that pledge on the coastprotectors.ca website. Why? We are protecting our home from invasion with our First Nations brothers and sisters. We are protecting our children from global warming we are fighting for sanity in an insane world, like those who fought nuclear weapons tooth and nail in the 20th century. We are fighting for our self-respect, to be smart, compassionate, grateful, and brave in the face of overwhelming odds. We've been here before, and we carry the torch forward 
to a future that we create. This here and now is paradise because we have the opportunity to create the future. Because we have reverence for our children. Because we have conviction in our values. In spite of our all too human brains and very humble hearts. We will all stand together in 2030 before our children and tell them in all humility, we did our best. That's all we can ask. We are trying to be brave. We are trying to be wise. We are trying to do our best. And may it be so, all my relations. I know this can't help but evoke visceral thoughts. And you want to dedicate this next moment, a few moments of time, about as many as it takes, to hear what you all, how you all react. I think he's absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. Issue of our time. What was the last part you just said? It's yeah. the issue of our time. It's the issue of our time. But he, he said, it's okay. He no. said uh, there's a conflict in the Unitarian group. What does he mean? Well, because we all drive our cars still. Yeah. We still burn oil and gas, and yet we know it's our downfall. We are videotaping. Please use the mic. Some people come here. Okay. What's the conflict again? Well, the, the conflict is really that uh, we all drive our car every day. We all burn our oil. And yet, and we aren't very, um, I mean, we know that it's a difficult solution. The solution is very difficult, but we have to find a solution or we're dead. And so we're Unitarians, we believe in, we understand what he said, it's heartfelt, it's obviously true, and yet we'll drive home today, I will too. And so in that way we're conflicted. So you're saying he's meaning that the people in the Unitarian Movement. Movement, thank you. Um, are in conflict of their actions, not their philosophy or their heart meaning. They're not conflicted. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That was my also my conflict in my heart that I'm going to be driving home today. I'm wondering if you, anybody has any solution of what we do instead of buying fossil fuel. Well... I've been finding out about electric vehicles, and I, 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 I do an environmental show on Kootenai Co-op Radio, and I had, this summer I've had three people on over the last few weeks who said electric vehicles are, are the way of the future. And, and um, I don't think it's an easy transition, um, but um, it's a necessary one. And a volunteer with the Eco Society did a, a plan for using zero fossil fuels by 2050. Uh, and it involves a whole bunch of changes, but they, they, they wanted to see what it would look like, how, how that would work. And um, it, it, uh, it depends on a huge change in transportation. We have to change how we heat our houses. We have to change a lot of things. But the huge, the biggest changes in transportation. So it was very interesting. I'm also considering an electric car, but then I think, okay, where does that electricity uh, come from? Come from? Answer? <laughs> well, in, in some places, it comes from you know, stored energy of water. Water, of course. Hydroelectric. Hydroelectric. I mean, we're lucky here. We have a better choice there. Obviously, in other areas, we don't have a better choice. But there are, is wind power that could be a greener solution. Photovoltaics, Photovoltaics uh, more efficiency in that, you know, produce, production of power. Wave energy. 
Yeah. Wave. Just, yeah. 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 Motion. Mm -hmm. Tidal energy. Yeah. There also there. Were, I think I heard. Was it Castlegar? There were ten electric cars, and someone wanted to go see them. They were sold out in two days. They, you can't buy an electric car uh, these days. Uh, they're very hard to come by. Yeah. yeah because um, the market, you know, um, and the one guy. I, I, I talked to pointed out that um, car companies are, are don't want to build a whole bunch of cars that won't get bought, but the demand is there, so right. the, the supply is going to. Right. And even a Prius is at least a better choice, uh, or a hybrid, I should say, not necessarily a Prius, you know, but um, because they use so much less fuel in the long run. Yeah. So. Are they both? Bill, you may be able to answer this question uh, to some degree. So the, the, the question of where does the energy come from to create a battery, and most of them are lithium ion, and so what's the energy consumption and sort of uh, uh, footprint of creating um, lithium ion batteries? Well, I, I certainly can't say it has zero footprint. That I can't say. But what we can hope for is to recognize where we can find greener sources of energy and uh, you know wind power and wave action and that it's it's really just starting to go in the other direction. I mean one of the issues too is that by investing in something like the tar sands exploitation, that of course when you invest in something, you expect it to only pay off in some kind of long term. You don't expect it pay off immediately. So once you make the commitment to this long-term investment, then you're kind of stuck with making it pay for itself. If you, if we could somehow stop the investment, that would actually help a lot, I think. I think a lot of the um, energy that is used is to transport our food. Mm. And it is a long past time that we um, stopped eating unseasonal foods. If we can get back to eating what we can grow and what will come to fruition in the season, and we stop expecting strawberries in December. Um, and those of us who can grow as much food as we can I think that this is going to be a very important diminution in uh, the expenditure of fossil fuels. Also, I think that a lot of people are very conflicted about Site C, the Site C dam, which um, John Horgan and uh, Andrew Weaver have um, said they will stop. But on the other hand, this is going to produce a whole lot of electricity, people are saying, well, BC doesn't need all that energy. It doesn't need all that electric energy. But there is room for a lot of debate there. Many, many of us don't want to see the, the fertile piece inundated. It's a conflict. Uh, I just want to quickly uh, say that to destroy the breadbasket of the North to produce power for the United States is not what I believe in for our country. Okay. Everybody can hear me. Um, I loved the talk. I, I, um, I think this guy is brilliant. And I really appreciated his weaving our personal sense of perception and worldview into First Nations culture. Um, and the implication that there's far more unity or connection among, and action, activism, united between the cultures, First Nations and new arrivals. Um, so I really loved that. Personally, I find um, that there is an overwhelming amount of choice about what to support environmentally 
that can feel paralyzing. So lots of choice. I get bombarded on my computer with petitions, and I'm skeptical about the efficacy of that, although the one about Kinder Morgan sounds like a huge collective action. At this stage, individually, um, it's also, I find, overwhelming to look at the amount of disaster, where it appears to me that parts of the world really are going to be uninhabitable, already are, and why are people talking about rebuilding? So lots of big questions. I'm heartened at the sense of empowerment through collective action and what he speaks to. Um, and that's probably the way I would go uh, and try to winnow down or narrow down the choices in a way that's meaningful and makes sense. One more comment. In terms of being energy efficient, most people I know are fairly responsible. Um, and personally, I am averse to feeling guilty um, about where I have to use fossil fuels, where I have to drive because I'm a senior, um, when I'm doing the best to be responsible in ways I can. And the rest, the guilt stuff, I'm not interested in that. I find most people, except one guy on my block who ran his water all summer, um, are generally pretty conscious in the Kootenays. And I applaud that. So thank you. In terms of areas of the world that may be uninhabited, I think I'm going to sort of read it. You know, the, so the environmental threat is, is uh, sort of an ongoing, long-term. We have a much more serious immediate threat between uh, our friend in uh, North Korea and our friend in Washington, and the potential for decimation of huge areas of the world uh, because of uh, two guys trying to thump their chests and prove one stronger than the other. And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that, that we've come to this and that uh, we, we, you know, if one of those guys pushes a button, it could be the end of a lot of civilization. Um, um, one is having uh, wondering how, where I could go to have a discussion on how to counter or stand up to bullies in many situations. I don't really know the answer actually. It's a kind of a new topic to me. The other um, is that I remembered Einstein. Einstein saying that a problem can't be solved in the same consciousness that it was created in. And again, I'm led back to um, the importance of um, coming into a coherent heart, meditation, group, group connections, and prayer being really a most powerful thing that we can do right now. I'm really, I, I just have to say what really strikes me about this particular talk by Carl. I've known him since the 90s. <clears throat> he has never said he's going to give up. He's always out there. He's taken sabbaticals, but he's always come back, pick up the cause. When he says in, 19, in 2030, I stop, that's very sobering to me. I mean, We've often thought of 2020 as really being the need point where maybe there's no coming back and that's really what it's almost looking like when you look at the weather patterns and the scent around the, the as we know, the Virgin Islands and all, all that. They, every year we say, well, we've never had a wind storm this strong in the last 80 years. Well, that's what we're seeing every year now. <laughs> when, when he says, I quit, in 2030, that, that resonates. 13 years from now. Hey, don't, they don't all quit. Pardon? Carl won't quit. Probably not. I don't believe he will quit. I don't believe he'll quit. It's a trick. 
Why, why, why would you quit? It's more fun not to. I hope he comes in March. Yes. Yeah. 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 I can do it. Oh, that would be great. We certainly would like to bring him. I know that he ended his service with um, a song called The Fire of Our Commitment. Um, we, we tried to put that one together, but... Next week. We not we really we really need um, uh, somebody who can carry a tune. <laughs> yeah. um, also, they don't have the music. I, I'd have to get the music. And we have to we have to get the music yeah. together. So perhaps another time we can do that. I have another song to offer if you like from okay. the Dance of the Universal Peace. Okay. I'd like to join. I'd like to stand. There's some uh, movements that go one, on with it. Okay, that's, that's that's let's do that. It's, uh, it comes from a dance mentor, that I, one of my, Grace Marie, is her name. <laughs> peace be with you, peace be with me, and all of our relations. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey. She and a colleague of hers uh, from a native, I don't remember which tribe she's from, but they both came together and created this song and dance for us. But I can't sing or hold the mic or move it. Just, we don't have to. No, we don't need the mic. You have a, you have a big so I'll just, uh, I'll just show you the motions and then we can sing it and then I don't have to teach, okay? Okay. Okay, peace be with you. It's a partner dance, but we'll adapt it here for the circle. Peace be with me. And we circle around and think of all the trees and the, all the relations the standing people, the star people, and we turn around and, and connect with everyone, all of our relations. The earth and the soil of all the land, the earth, the, the waters, all the creatures in the waters. Uh -huh. And then the second I will do it, peace be with you, peace be with me. And then the other direction. So the male and female are balanced. And then we'll take the steps into the center um, with the heyas, and we'll raise our arms slowly to create a sort of tiki pole. And we'll cross our arms, tiki pole. So we're inviting all our relations to be in our in our hearts, uh, like in our t sacred home, sacred tiki. And they go like almost like this. Your arms out. Yeah, like tiki pole. No, not holding them. Like as if you're making a tiki. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, cross, and cross your neighbor's hand. A little bit. A little bit. There we go. And then, and then we step back and we bring our hands together. That's it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, we'll learn the song. Okay. Peace be with you. Peace be with me. Yeah. <laughs>
I know it's true. Oh, well, go ahead. You can take them. I'd like to take this moment to uh, receive this offering in the spirit that it was given. And recognizing that it's always the first step. Today is the first step. We can always imagine a new way to meet the challenge. So we carefully extinguish this flame at this time or suspend its light until the next week. We get to sit down for now. Okay. Yeah. We, can, we can blow those out. It's probably easier. Yeah. Everyone can help blow them out. Yeah, that's good. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Announcements. All right, we can sit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Announcements. Um, so we proceeded on um, October 22nd, as you probably know, is our, our membership ceremony. And uh, so our we created, the first one. Yeah, it's the first formal covenant uh, of our congregation. Why Sorry. Why not? Yeah. It's the first formal covenant of our congregation together to become formal members of uh, the Unitarian community and covenanting with each other as well. So we've created a little invite. Um, and could we pass these around? Everybody can take one. And uh, it's a little invite. <laughs> as I was folding it, I realized I made a mistake on it. Uh, there's an address. We're going to have dinner on the Saturday. There's going to be, on the weekend of the 22nd, uh, Reverend Deborah Thorne's coming from, from Vancouver, from Westminster. Beacon, Beacon Unitarian to, to preside over our ceremony, and then we're going to get together on the Saturday before and have a workshop about the deeper meanings of membership, and then um, a potluck supper at Michael and Julie's. And I don't, there's no, I don't think there is a Hume Street in Nelson. I made that up. So the address, <laughs> the address, and, I, and Michael told me the address. So we, I, I'm going to get the address for Michael and Julie. And we're going to have to pencil that in on the leaflet because I've got it wrong on all of them. Don't they live on observatory? No, they live on Hoover. Hoover. I believe Hoover. it's uh, Hoover. I it's Hoover, but yeah, I, I had the H right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so this is the beginning, and we're going to. So I also there's also some cards, so we can invite people from the community to join us for that special Hoover service Street. as well. So we can invite as many people as we want to join us as we go through that process of coming and becoming members. And inside this brochure, there's um, a little bit of information. Uh, uh, Anne, Anne created uh, or found most of it, and I added a little bit. Um, it's about, there's information on becoming a member and, and what it means to become a member. And um, the part I added is because we, you can also become a friend. You don't have to become a formal member. There's, you can support and be here. You don't get kicked out if you don't become a member. <laughs> It's all the same. So, so it's not all the same, but it's it's uh, it's also possible. <laughs> also, uh, speaking. What's the number? Okay, well I know who is the. Um, I wanted to mention that on two, this Tuesday evening, the BC Utilities Commission is having a public hearing about the Site C Dam here in Nelson. It's at 6 o'clock at the Best Western Hotel on Baker Street. And um, you, can, you can sign up to uh, make a presentation, a short presentation about it, uh, at bcuc.com, or uh, just coming and showing that you're concerned about uh, the, uh, the Site C Dam. So that's, that's Tuesday night, and that's happening right away here. So I wanted to mention that as well. Dale, is there a, a, a way that we can download that talk and share it? I can easily send it to you. Yeah. 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 And also, okay, th th these things, this actually is available on the UCV website. They have a section there called Sermons. You can find it. And this one is from, the date is given May, May the 21st or something like that, May this year. You'll be able to find it there too. Plus, 
even the last week's one uh, from Steve Anderson. But I can send it to you if I know where to send it. I have Daniel's address. Yeah. Yeah. But we can, she said she she's going to send it to you. She's got your address. Yeah. Okay. Is there any more announcement, announcements then? I don't know what the uh, events are for the river celebration. But. Dance of the Universal Peace uh, this afternoon. And oh. I'm sorry. Dance of the Universal Peace at the old church at, uh, I think it's, I think it's 2.30. It's either 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Usually 3, isn't it? 3, I think, I think you're right. I think John has to be there at 2.30. 3 o'clock. It's 3 o'clock, 3 to 5. So, and some of what... Danya did for us was, you know, part of the dance of Universal Peace. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> John has to be there too. <laughs> Last chance. If that's it, we'll just do our carry the flame, which is my favorite song. And it's pretty simple. How do you turn the camera Where's off? Stop? Where's stop? I can do it. Open mic. Oops. Thank you. Show me. <laughs> Stop record, or it's not recording anymore, or something. Bet you it's this button right here. <laughs> 